Hello and welcome to the show. Today we're asking, does rationality disprove naturalism? We're looking at the argument for God from reason. Max baker Heitch is a philosopher from Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. He believes that an atheist materialist account of reality can't make sense of our ability to reason, think and understand and make arguments. Alex O'Connor is a well-known online as The Cosmic Skeptic. It's an atheist YouTube channel where he regularly engages with arguments for God. He'll be responding to Max's challenge that the very reason and rationality that many atheists celebrate, in fact, points to God. So, Alex and Max, welcome along to the show. Thanks for having me again. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. here. Um, Alex, you've been on before. That's right, um, a few times now. Yeah, a few times. I'm kind so of losing count. In our radio studio, usually. But, yeah, yeah, um, this is a nice development. I've, I've been able to witness your online profile grow and grow over that time. And of course, you're now a student at Oxford University. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in your life. But it's, it's great to have you back. On yeah, it, it's, it's great to be here, too. I, I do. Th- I think it is a bit absurd that, that I'm being sat uh, next to people who've actually finished their degrees and DPhils, and, and I'm just this lowly undergraduate who manages somehow to but get across the table. I think it speaks from... for the fact that you've grown a really interesting audience online who want to hear your perspectives on things, um, and I do appreciate you coming in to sort of, you know, have a go um, opposite Max with just seeing what this argument is about, and I will be learning uh, as well during this process, Max. You've, um, your first time on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, this argument, uh, how did you first come across it? And tell us a little bit, first yeah. of all, as well, about what you do and your role as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm tutor in philosophy at Wycliffe Hall, and I'm um, on, on the philosophy faculty at Oxford. Um, been doing that job for nearly four years now. I did my doctorate in philosophy at, at Oxford, um, actually looking at um, Alvin planting his epistemology, um, something that's probably been debated on this show a number of times. So I know it has been debated on the show. Um, and yeah, so I, how did I come across this uh, argument? I guess, I mean, I um, sort of picked up Lewis um, about, I don't know, 10 years ago for the first time. Mere Christianity was the first thing of his I read, as is probably the case for many people. And then um, then I picked up Miracles, which is the book where Lewis tries to develop this argument. And I have to say, I don't think he he uh, expounds the argument in a very clear and lucid way, because I think I think in general, you know, whether or not we think his arguments are good, I think many people would agree he's quite a clear writer. But I think this argument takes a bit of unraveling, uh, but I think it is is a pretty interesting argument and, and s- at least su- supplies some interesting material for discussion. Mm. I mean, in a nutshell, maybe mm. d- just give us a sense of what the argument is and then d- just be interested in hearing what Lewis did with it. I know there was a famous episode when he was mm. challenged on it by a contemporary uh, philosopher, Elizabeth Anscombe, and, and obviously others have taken and developed it as well over that time. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the best way to summarize the argument is actually with a quote from someone else, um, J.B.S. Haldane, who is a philosopher um, who influenced Lewis. But Lewis obviously thinks this is a very key passage. And I, I, I do kind of think it encapsulates the argument. And it just goes like this. If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but that doesn't make them sound logically. And hence, I have no reasons for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. So, I mean, um, yeah, I, as I said, Lewis sort of um, tries to build this argument and, and it gets sort of, uh, there are certain nuances to the way he, he does that, that I, where I wouldn't follow him. But um, yeah. Um, what was this episode where he kind of, I think, presented this? Yes. I think Miracles where he presents the argument had been published at this Mm. point and he sort of went to defend it in a kind of Socratic type dialogue with Elizabeth Anscombe. I I guess this would be. Yeah, that's right. So the original. Yes, that's right. So the original version of Miracles was published in 1948 and um, it's actually surprisingly hard to get hold of the original Mm. version now. Um, So, yeah, he um, Lewis debated Elizabeth Anscombe, who's actually also a Christian. but she was quite critical of this argument and and Lewis uh, tried to defend the argument and you know there are v- various accounts of what happened but um it seems that Lewis felt he was kind of um brought up short in that exchange and that that Anscombe had pointed to some some quite serious flaws in the argument um 
But then Lewis went on to revise um, the argument, and um, it was published again, a revised version of Miracles in 1960, where he'd really tried to take on board Anscombe's criticisms. And um, and actually, there's an essay that Anscombe wrote um, much later in the 80s, you know, quite a long mm-hmm. time after Lewis died, where she reflects on how Lewis had changed the argument. Um, and she kind of commends him and, and as she said, because yeah, it, yeah, I mean, she's very cautious in her mm. wording, but she says um, it provides material for serious discussion, material mm. which is genuinely problematic for naturalism. Well, we'll come maybe to some of the ways in which it's been developed as well later on um, with people like Plantinger and, and so mm. forth. But um, you're probably aware, obviously, Alex, that I've sort of employed my sort of take on this argument a little bit both in when we sat down for a discussion on your podcast Mm. and in that um, uh, dialogue I had with Stephen Woodford rationality rules in in Oxford as well and I've always been quite influenced actually I remember actually in my gap year before going up to Oxford myself reading miracles and thinking wow I've never heard this I've never seen this it was like a as I said in the debate a penny dropping moment for me this this argument which for me again I, if I could summarize, it would be something along the lines of um, if our thoughts are purely reducible ultimately to the activity of um, electrons and chemicals and atoms in the brain, there's nothing true or false about the activity of chemicals and electrons in the brain. There simply is cause and effect. There's a physical thing going on. Uh, and at, at what level do you then invest that with the trust of, of giving you something true, something reliable? Because it is ultimately there's nothing true or false about one atom bumping into another atom. That at a very simple level is kind of where I sort of, the, the, the central thought that suddenly made me think, gosh, that's a really pro- big problem for anyone who believes that everything is ultimately material. And we kind of traced that out a little bit, talking about determinism specifically when I came yes. on your show and, and why I felt that that equally there were some issues around if we were all bound to believe the things we believe. What does that say for rationality in the way we come to arrive at yeah. our beliefs? And I, th- so I found it particularly interesting that, because uh, the, the first time we mentioned this was after filming, t- taping one of your shows, and, right. and we kind of we, we stood just uh, at, at the door, at, at the door, we, talking as you were about leaving, it. And, I said, "I'd love to have a debate with you." Yeah, on, and I remember thinking about it, and then I had you on the podcast, and yeah. we only got to it near the end, didn't have much time, and then I asked you about it in the Q and A, but we never really got to, to <laughs> sink our teeth into it. But the, I found it really interesting that. Um, well, one of the things that, that I want to uh, sort of bring into this conversation mm. is whether similar criticisms about the trust that we can have in reason and the legitimacy that we can afford it uh, are also true of a, a religious worldview. Mm-hmm. And when you spoke about reading miracles, and as you say, it was like the penny dropped, it just kind of washed you over with this with this kind of process of thought. And I remember thinking, but your criticism was that if your thought processes are determined not by your choices, not mm-hmm. by what you are, are able to kind of consider for yourself, but just by kind of deterministic factors, uh, then it isn't a rational process. Well, mm-hmm. it's like every single decision you ever make, right? Mm-hmm. And as somebody who, uh, as listeners might not be aware, doesn't believe in free will for, for a number of reasons. Um, but like if, if you take the approach that I, I think is almost trivially true, that you can't choose to be convinced of things, right? you don't get to decide what convinces you, that when something kind of washes you over, like miracles obviously did to you, that's essentially a deterministic process happening, right? It's just something that you had no control over, just a cause and effect, and suddenly mm. your mind is convinced. Mm. And yet the thing that you're claiming to be convinced of by that process is that such processes cannot be rational. Mm. And I found that to be a yeah. strange irony. Well, I don't want to repeat the debate mm. at this point, mm. but um, I, th- I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had there. Because mm. It might be slightly different to what we're talking about today. Yeah, it's certainly separate. Um, yeah. Uh, because it's, I think that's more about whether you need freedom <clears throat> to be able to look at the alternatives and come to a decision or whether that is, if you like, just as much a determined process yeah. over which we have mm-hmm. no choices as any kind of deterministic process. But we'll maybe park that one for the moment unless Max yeah. wants to specifically no, I, to I, it. No, actually just to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to, I'm, I'm not certain, but I'm inclined to actually agree with Alex on that one. So, I mean, I think um, in epistemology, um, philosophers talk about this view that's known as doxastic involuntarism. And what that simply means is that we don't have voluntary control over our beliefs. So pick any belief, uh, Mm. sorry, pick any proposition or statement that you believe to be false. The moon is made of cheese. See if you can will yourself to voluntarily believe that the moon is made of cheese and you you can't do Mm. it. 
And so, yeah, I, I, I'm actually probably with Alex on mm. the thought that um, the way that um, things strike us, the way that um, it appears that the evidence stacks up, uh, that's not something that we can sort yeah, of have you don't control. Have, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'd love to do a separate show maybe because um, yeah. someone else, another philosopher that may, the name that may uh, you guys may know, Philip Goff, who's been on the show mm -hmm. before, uh, he sent me a paper by another philosopher um, who has actually done some work in this and, and thinks there is mm. a case for why we do need freedom to be able to mm. um, assent to, to hear um, that. the evidence as it's yeah. presented to us. But anyway, that's a little bit of a digression. Yeah. From, Although from I do think the, I do think it's relevant in the sense of mm. like, if if uh, you're willing to concede this idea that you can have rational decision making processes that are essentially deterministic, that are just kind of uh, causal just cause and effect working rather than anything else anything supernatural mm. anything anything more than just uh the the causal relation between the uh propositions presented to somebody and mm. the methods of the brain by which they come to believe them then i think there's perhaps an analogy here with the way that i'm the, the way that i'm thinking about rational thought in general i mean mm -hmm. it's important to me because i don't think I, I don't just think that we don't have free will i think that we can't have free will i mm. think it's an incoherent concept and so if we can kind of take instances where somebody doesn't have uh, free will and show that there's still rationality, I think this would apply in all cases. I think the same logic applies mm. if you see what I mean. It's like the, the idea of mm. having a, a, a deterministic, causal, naturalistic process that convinces you of propositions mm. that we would have no trouble calling rational, despite realizing that it isn't something we control, it isn't something that has any kind of other agency uh, a, as a part of it. I think that reason and rationality can essentially just be defined is acting in accordance with what's true of the world. Now, how we might know that we're doing mm. so is a, is a difficult question, but the ability to do so on a naturalistic worldview, I think, is certainly not ruled out. Uh, would you want to respond? To, yeah, to just briefly. I mean, I, I what I want to say about that is, um, I think it's important not to assume that um, uh, non-physical mental causation must be indeterministic. So I'm quite happy with saying, now for the purposes of this debate, I'm sort of agnostic about whether there's libertarian free will. Nothing I say will depend on it. But um, I think what's really key is the argument I'm going to defend doesn't um, hinge on sort of saying that determinism is incompatible with um, with intentionality and, and, and rationality. Um, rather, it's um, that the sort of building blocks that you get if you have a physicalist, naturalist um, ontology um, don't give you what you need in order to get um, things like intentionality that I think we'll come to in a minute. And yeah, so it, so let me just grant that determinism is true, but it doesn't follow that all causation is physical causation. You can have mental causation. You could even have supernatural causation that's deterministic. And um, so, that, so yeah, I th I think it, I I can fully concede determinism for the purposes of this debate, and it doesn't affect the argument. Uh, let, let's first of all define maybe um, naturalism, because the, mm. the the argument specifically here is against naturalism being a good grounding for re the act of reasoning. Mm. Basically, um, there's also, of course, if you like, beyond that, um, an argument for why it also points to God. But um, e even just if you were able to in some way refute naturalism, that would be a pretty big deal, mm -hmm. you know, if, if this is what the argument actually does. Um, now, naturalism, do you, do you want to give a definition of how you understand yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think this, the, what I'm going to say, I think is fairly, um, would be fairly uncontentious among philosophers who subscribe to naturalism. So I think it, naturalism could be defined as three theses. Um, about the basic um, ontological sort of makeup of reality. So the first is that the universe is a closed system of cause uh, of physical cause and effect. Um, so s call that the the causal closure of the physical. Mm -hmm. um, so that just says that there are there are no supernatural causes. Uh, there are no um, uh, non physical mental causes mm -hmm. um, in the world. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that all that exists ultimately has to be kind of built out of the basic uh, building blocks of physics. Um, so um, now the naturalist, I don't think, is committed to thinking that what physics currently says is, you know, the smallest subatomic particle. 
uh, is what physics will eventually say sure. are the basic constituents mm. of the universe. But yeah, so I think naturalism is committed to saying that whatever, the, if you like, the ultimate physics mm. says are the basic building blocks of physics. Everything that exists has yeah. to ultimately be built mm -hmm. from that. Okay. Um, and then, um, and you, you could call that thesis just physicalism, I suppose. And then the third one, um, the third thesis would be that those basic building blocks of physics, whether they be you know, fields uh, or subatomic particles, um, you know, whatever they are, they are, um, you know, intrinsically um, lacking in consciousness. You know, they they lack a first person point of view. They don't have experiences. Um, they lack purposes um, and values. Mm. So, so I mean, I suppose in very brief, the way I, I would tend to summarise that the naturalistic point of view um, is that all that exists ultimately is the, the material stuff of the universe um, and that there are no, mm. as you say, supernatural, <clears throat> as, as the term suggests, element things going on beyond that. Um, uh, so sometimes it's almost synonymous with a physicalist or materialist mm. view. <clears throat> I mean, t I just want to check... Is that something you personally hold? Is that the kind of where you would lay your cards if you were asked, well, what is your view? Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful universe? to say, I, I, I mean, naturalists will, will approach it differently. Some will just kind of hold to the idea that it's at least potentially possible for that, that kind of worldview to be coherent mm -hmm. or are unconvinced that there are supernatural elements. Um, and then there are those who assert that there that there is nothing yeah. more than they, they all kind of fit for the purposes of this discussion mean the same thing. Um, myself, I'm, I'm always inclined to just uh, to, to withhold assent to a belief until I'm con until I can be convinced mm. of it. So I'd rather say that I'm unconvinced of the supernatural element. Um, otherwise, I suppose it would be less worth my time being here. Yeah, as sure. Well, but but, but it I, means and, in, and in I appreciate to, that in order for this discussion to happen, you'll you'll kind of be. Um, advocating for an actual yeah. position. But of course, you know, in, in order to say that I'm unconvinced yeah. by a supernatural element to the universe, I have to defend the, the possibility or plausibility of, of, a of, of a naturalistic worldview. account. Mm. Exactly. And if, and if, I suppose, if this argument were to, let's say, mm. convince you, Alex, you know, yeah. hypothetically, then you, that would that give you a little bit more reason to, um, to, to, to some more confidence in a theistic, say, um, view mm. of the universe? Well, if the argument worked and convinced me, then I'd, I'd have to... Uh, renounced naturalism and yeah. I may be inclined towards theism reason being because the argument is essentially that naturalism doesn't work yeah uh, and mm -hmm. so if I'm convinced that naturalism doesn't work then I have to become sure. uh, a non-naturalist <clears throat> and like you say that's it's another step uh, to, to get to mm -hmm. any kind of specific theism but it's like probably the most important step I think mm -hmm. uh, when, when approaching at least an atheist listener well we've got about 45 minutes to convince him Max <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean I, I'm it's sure been tried before <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. This will be a f really interesting interaction. So, um, I mean, do you want to add anything um, mm. in terms of your own sort of the way you now sketch out this argument, Max? And obviously yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you both mm. to keep it as accessible yeah. as possible no, for, for the non-philosophers, uh, including me listening. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Um, well, let me just say something in general about how I approach philosophical arguments um, about God and metaphysics. So. I generally um, am not that fond of deductive arguments where you have some premises that are supposed to logically entail their conclusion. Um, and I prefer probabilistic arguments. Um, one reason for that, for that is just that I think with deductive arguments, um, it, it, it has the surface appearance of giving a certain conclusion if the premises are true. But, but of course, actually, the problem is rarely are we ever certain that the premises are true and then the conclusion can't be more certain than the premises. So I prefer just to make the, the uncertainty explicit in the way we formulate the argument. So I prefer probabilistic arguments and without going into te sort of lots of detail, you know, Bayes' theorem is the way that a lot of philosophers will kind of formulate probabilistic mm. arguments. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just to give a, an example that has nothing to do with God, I mean, suppose that... Um, you know, we've got a piece of evidence, um, namely that the leaves on someone's lawn uh, sort of spell out their name. And then we, we're considering two hypotheses. One is that they're, that the person's spouse kind of raked the leaves into this nice pattern to spell out their name. The other is that the wind did it. Um, now, um, you know, it looks as though one of those hypotheses makes this 
observation of the, the leaves spelling out this name, one of those hypotheses makes that piece of data more, much more probable mm. than the other one. Mm. And so it, it, it probabilistically confirms the, the spouse did it mm -hmm. hypothesis, um, but not with certainty, yeah. you know. Sure. It is possible that the wind did yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's just to say about, yeah. you know, in general, how I approach these things. And so I think what I want to say is, and so that's one difference with, from the way Lewis wants yeah, to do yeah. it, which is more deductively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, in general, when we come to questions um, to do with you know, evidence for and against God, the way I like to think of it is in terms of several families of phenomena, uh, striking phenomena about the world that we would like to try and um, explain. And so, um, you know, think of sort of cosmological family uh, one family of phenomena would be sort of the cosmological mm -hmm. stuff to do with the you know, that there is a universe at all that it began to exist and so on another family of phenomena would be the teleological um you know things like the the so-called kind of fine tuning of the constants of the universe <clears throat> that sort of thing another family might be what you call the axiological or the moral you know, that we have these intuitions, that, mm. that we have these objectively binding duties and so on. Um, and another family, and, and this is what we're going to be focusing on, is what you might call the noological. So ha phenomena having to do with the mind. Mm. Now, of course, I should add, in, of course, the naturalist philosopher will rightly want to bring up two other families of phenomena, namely evil and hiddenness, mm -hmm. uh, if you, ambiguity of evidence concerning God, and, and a, that, there's a whole huge conversation to have that. <clears throat> but so, yeah, as I said, the, the noological um, uh, phenomena having to do with the mind are basically what I, I think um, you know, Lewis's argument w was drawing attention to some of these phenomena and, and pointing out that they, it, it seemed to him at least, that those are difficult to account for on naturalism. So um, basically the, the way I want to do this is to sort of um, point to three or four phenomena um, that individually and taken collectively are um, more probable given some kind of um, metaphysical view where consciousness, purpose, intentionality is at sort of the base layer of reality, mm. if you like. Um, and, and of course, theism isn't the only such hypothesis, I'm sure we'll come on to this. So it, it's not sort of directly an argument for, mm. for, the, for specifically theism. Yeah. So, so these phenomena are more, more probable given a hypothesis where consciousness, purpose, value and so on are mm. at the base layer. Uh, as as compared with on a, a naturalistic yeah. hypothesis, which, which you know, just we've just laid out, the, the physical layer. stuff yeah. at the base layer. Okay. So, so intentionality is one such phenomenon. So intentionality is basically the aboutness of thoughts. So uh, just to take an example, the, take, take the word London. Um, you know, so we can all be thinking um, of the word London in our heads and and it that word is about something it's about the city in which we're having this conversation <clears throat> and the the basic thought is here that um this uh, property of thoughts um where thoughts are are able to to have representational content they're they're able to be about something other than themselves um, is difficult to square with this naturalist uh, picture of of what reality is made of um, the thought being that, um, you know, um, if you like, atoms swerving in the void, uh, that's what thoughts have to be at the end of the day, if naturalism is true. Um, atoms swerving in the void can't be about anything. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and actually, <clears throat> this is a problem that, that is recognized by a number of um, leading naturalist philosophers. So John Searle, um, who's written a lot on this sort of stuff, says that so far no attempt at naturalizing intentional content has ever produced an explanation of intentional content that's remotely plausible. Now, I'm sure a Alex will probably want to bring up computers, and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll leave that yeah. for now. We can come yeah. back to that. But the, the basic thought here is um, that simply, you know, an, an arrangement of atoms mm. um, can no more be about the city in yeah. which we find ourselves than this table can be. Right. Um, 
And so, so that's, that's one phenomenon that seems hard to account for, given what naturalism says the world Be- is made of. Before yeah. you come to the yeah. others, um, we're, we're, we're fast approaching almost our, our first break, so time is flying by. <clears throat> um, how, would you be able to sketch the other three? And yeah. We'll start with intentionality absolutely. on the other side of the break and then see what else we can fit, fit yeah, in as we Yeah, absolutely. Go. So the, the next one is um, what you might call mental causation. Um, so the thought here is simply that um, in order to arrive at a, a conclusion of a chain of reasoning that is um, justified, if you like, um, thoughts need to cause each other in virtue of their, con- their, their propositional content. They need to cause each other in virtue of yeah. what they're about, not just in virtue of physical pushes mm. and pulls. Mm. And given... Again, given what naturalism says the world is made of, um, physical stuff, and given the causal closure of the physical, uh, again, it seems just very hard to square um, the, th- the idea that thoughts cause one another in virtue of what they're about, mm. as opposed to merely in virtue of physical pushes and pulls. So it's sort of linked to the intentionality, <clears throat> the aboutness of thoughts. I, I would say but, so, but yeah. one thought that's about something yes. causes another thought about something if yes. ultimately those are simply two physical events happening. That's right, yeah. and yes, exactly. So this this one is really an expansion of the first. Yeah. Um, intentionality, you could sort of get that if you just had one thought sure. on its own, yeah. but then this second one is about yeah. how thoughts relate yeah. to each other. And then the third one, I suppose, is is this thing that, that Planting has talked about, um, and I, and I will probably come on to this. I, I would endorse a more qualified version of that, but I think, the key point is that it's hard to see why minds that were shaped by an, an unguided process of natural selection would have the capacity for um, n- not just for kind of navigating our way around our physical environment, getting food and that kind of thing, but for for doing quantum physics and, and metaphysics mm. and mm. so on. It seems to be <clears throat> unreasonably kind of the, the level at which we're able to introspect and think seems well mm. beyond the, the, the physical needs yeah, of evolution. I think so. And and, and, I would, and it's not just that. I mean, you could extrapolate, look, you need some kind of reasoning processes mm. to navigate your way mm. around the Sahara or, you know, whatever, um, the savannah. Um, but then it's that philosophy in particular depends on certain intuitions. Um, it's not just about reasoning processes. You have to have some raw material. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the gist of the argument there. And was there a fourth or was that the... Well, I mean, I, I, I hesitate well, to let, throw this let, in because it's a lot. But... Let's leave it there. That, yeah. That's so much to respond to already. Yeah, and yeah. We'll, 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 we'll have our hands full, I'm sure, on the other side of a, a quick break as Alex wants to, to pick mm-hmm. up some of those points. So um, we'll, we're going to take a quick uh, break and we'll be back. We're talking about the argument from reason for God. Does rationality disprove naturalism? My guests today on the show are Alex O'Connor and Max baker Heitch. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. We're talking about the argument from reason for God today. Uh, Here on Unbelievable, my guests are Max baker Heitch, philosopher from Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. Um, And he's making the case that the atheist materialist account of reality can't make sense of our ability to reason, think, understand and make arguments. Alex O'Connor, well known as the cosmic skeptic online, is here to respond. Um, And okay, lots to respond to there. Um, Mm. And I don't know where you want to begin, but maybe we'll we'll start with this issue of intentionality that, uh, Mm. that Max first brought up, which is the aboutness of thoughts that we have thoughts that are about london for instance and and in what sense can a you know something that ultimately is is reducible to a physical thing atoms electrons and so on be about anything um as i say huge metaphysical problem in the philosophy of mind but um where where would you begin with with that kind of an issue i want to make sure i'm understanding this correctly I, I'm struggling almost to see the contention. I think that the, the capacity for abstract thought that, and the uh, explanations for how that could have developed um, within human consciousness is not particularly controversial. And I'd also say that, for instance, there are people who are not capable of thinking about London, namely people who've never heard of London and never experienced London. Um, in other words, the, the thoughts that we have that are about things are predicated on our on our experience of these things, right? An evolutionary account of how we've come to develop our cognitive faculties would be perfectly in line with this view of reality that um, 
there is a selective advantage in being able to think abstractly. There is a selective advantage about being able to remember things that we've experienced and think about them when they're not immediately in our face. Um, it's, it's clear to see how these things could be evolutionarily selected for. And this is why I think this actually ties into the last argument that was made, which I think is the most interesting one, um, about how if things came about through naturalistic processes, it seems that we would have selected for uh, survival rather than for truth, mm. right? Like why would we, this, we? This was Alvin planting his famous evolutionary yes. argument against natural. Well, we do, you know, we don't. As as um, as we've discussed, we don't evolve to do quantum physics. But it's mm. like I think that that's evidenced by the fact that we are currently trying to use reason to overcome our naturalistic uh, approach to something like quantum physics and our our. our intuitions that we have, our psychological intuitions that have come about through our biological um, evolution, it's clear to see why we are not able to understand the, the unimaginably small and the unimaginably mm. large in science because we didn't evolve uh, for those purposes. However, we're using reason to overcome that, right? It's not, that, that isn't, we're not saying that kind of we've evolved uh, uh, we've evolved the ability to, to talk about quantum physics. We're saying that we've really evolved the, the inability to do so, and we're trying to use reason to overcome that. Um, I think that there is selective advantage to truth in many ways, but I can understand why people would have the contention that um, because selection is governed uh, by survival rather than truth, we'd, ha we'd be wary to, uh, to trust it. But this is where I want to also come back on, on what you said, Max, about... Um, <clears throat> deductive arguments. Uh, I think, uh, do you mean to say where, when you talk about reason not really working on a naturalistic worldview that deductive arguments themselves would also not work? Because another problem with deductive arguments, not so much a problem but an interesting observation, is that they essentially provide no new information. They are tautological in nature. Right? You have two premises and you have a conclusion and the fact that the conclusion logically follows means that the conclusion just has the same semantic value as the two premises put together. Right? So you've just got a tautology. So to say that that doesn't work on a naturalistic worldview is to say that tautologies don't work on a naturalistic worldview. That is, something like um, P is P could not be kind of justifiably, reasonably true on a naturalistic worldview. Um, to me, I, I'm one of those people who's of the opinion that the laws of logic are, are almost somewhat transcendent in a sense of like their necessary truth, right? I think there are certain things that we can know a priori, and I think that the, the laws of logic are, are, are an example of that. Do, do you think that if naturalism were true, we could trust deductive arguments? Yeah, <clears throat> okay, so there's quite a lot to respond to there. Um, so yeah, let me start with deduction. So um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I share the view of um, most philosophers that uh, the laws of logic hold in all possible worlds mm. that they, they couldn't have been different. So in one sense, um, yeah, deduction works in a naturalistic universe just as well as in a theistic universe. But the issue there is our capacity to acquire knowledge via deduction. And so um, that basically in order to acquire knowledge of a conclusion of a dedu deductive argument, you need to know the truth of the premises and you need to know the validity of um, the entailment, right? Um, so give us an example, like yeah, just, just okay. a trivial so, one, you know. So sure, of, uh, so um, uh, all all human beings are mortal, premise one. Uh, Socrates is mortal, premise two. Um, sorry, Socrates, say, is so a human. Socrates is a human, <laughs> premise two. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Yeah, yeah so, so, I mean, um, the uh, it doesn't matter whether or not theism is true for, for that um for that argument to be deductively to be valid and sound, but yeah, the, the, sound. the key issue here is is our capacity to recognise the deductive validity of um, of an argument like that, and I think this goes to a deeper issue, really. That so, Alex, you uh, maybe I didn't use the best example with with the the word London, but I mean I think the point here is supposed to be uh, quite a fundamental one. It's not just the capacity for abstract thought; it's the th it's the capacity for any thought whatsoever to have any representational content whatsoever. And and you said that um, evolution you know, gives us accounts of how cognition would have developed. And I don't really dispute that. But I think the key point is ev those evolutionary models are silent on these metaphysical questions of, uh, yes. Just, just, just to be able to kind of then just uh, present this in a package and, and allow Alex to respond to it. So let's say, you know, that taking that argument, um, all humans are mortal. Mm. Socrates is a human, therefore 
Socrates is mortal. Okay. So the person sort of thinking about that, reasoning yeah. that through, they're having to have thoughts about Socrates being yeah. human. They've got to have a thought about all humans being mortal. Um, and and so the, at the first level, from what I heard you saying earlier, Max, the, the, the point is, how, how, how do these physical events in our brain mm. map onto mm -hmm. um, uh, something being about someone, yeah. about Socrates, about his mortality, yes. and so on? Um, and then secondly, how do, we, how do we see, if you like, that those two things together mm. entail yes. the conclusion? And, yeah. and, and, and that, again, is, an, is, is a linked but different issue in, in this kind of causation yes. as you see it. You know, the, why does one physical event mm. entail this other mm. yes. physical event, but, but it's actually the content of those thoughts? And and yeah. So should we pass the ball back? Just yes. At, no. That that's point? helpful. Thanks, is, is that Yeah, of, that's good. I mean, the, yeah. No. There, yeah. Are, there are two important and separable questions. Mm. The first being knowledge of like the premises, but secondly, mm. as you say, knowledge of the validity of the mm. inference. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, as I say, deductive arguments are just tautological, meaning that what we're talking about is an ability to recognize that two things mm. are the same. Right. It's an ability in, in the same way that like. Um, if you have two thoughts that are just identical in content, if you have, you know, um, the bus is red, therefore the bus is red. To ask about how we could know that that's a valid inference seem, seems a bit strange. It's like surely we're just talking about the ability to recognize that two things are the same. It's not, it's not really about a relationship between them. It's about just recognizing a similarity. And I think that's what's going on in a deductive argument. When we say that all men are mortal and that Socrates is, 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 is a man, we are saying that uh, Socrates is mortal. It's essentially just a linguistic feature that we separate these into two premises and ultimately a conclusion. And we say that we derive the conclusion. I think that we derive the conclusion linguistically, but, but what we're actually just doing is reframing the premises into a new form that are, you know, that is a helpful thing to do for philosophy because we can then kind of build upon those conclusions as well. But that's what mm. I think we're talking about is just a recognition that two things are the same. I don't know if you agree does with that, that. Does that? Um, yeah, so I, I'm uh, this idea that um, all deductive arguments are tautologies. I mean, <clears throat> um, I think that there's a good deal of philosophers who would not be particularly happy with that way of characterizing deductive arguments. I mean, I think, um, you know, that so the thing is, um, the premises of that. So, so to boil it down, actually, what the argument that we've just been discussing, the example has the following form, you know, um, uh, P is the first premise. If P, then Q. Um, therefore, Q. So that that's what's known as modus ponens. And um, the validity of that rule is. I, I mean, th this would get us quite um, far. Take us quite far afield into philosophy of logic and so on. But but that inference rule, known as modus ponens, that says you know P then. P, if P then Q, therefore Q. Um, that inference rule itself is something that we have to, um, you know, somehow grasp with our minds in order to come to a justified belief in the conclusion. And and so I, and I don't think um, I mean to say it's a tautology makes it sound like, I mean let, let's suppose it is, but that doesn't really help us understand this this um, you know thing that I've been alluding to is this question of well how if thoughts are atoms swerving in the void, is it the case that those atoms are about modus ponens? Yeah, I, I suppose for me that's the yeah. central point but, here. But I, it, I feel it, like it's. I think it's. It's not it, to say that the atoms are about something is to kind of. It's using something of a reverse fallacy of composition. It seems to me to be saying that everything's made up of mm -hmm. atoms. Therefore, thoughts must be. If a thought is about London, it must just be atoms about London in some sense. It's like, I, I think it's in the same way as saying like a book is made of atoms, but a book can be about London despite the atoms of the book being made up of not about London. If you see mm -hmm. what I'm saying, right? So like we're talking about a naturalistic process which has given rise to something mm -hmm. which can attach mm -hmm. itself to abstract thought. We're not talking about the process itself. Uh, and the building blocks upon which it's based um, being the thing that does the thinking, right? It's, yeah, it, it's so, just, just as like a, yeah. a, an atom mm -hmm. is not self-replicating uh, to, to kind of, because when we talk about consciousness and, and, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of muddies the, the waters because it becomes a bit um, difficult to think about. But with any other evolutionary process, we can recognize, you know, a, a, an atom is not self-replicating, but you put enough atoms together in the right sort of way and mm -hmm. you get a cell that's self-replicating. Um, and, and that's, 
that's not a, that's not a problem like i wouldn't turn around and say mm. but like it makes no sense on a naturalistic worldview to say that a cell is self-replicating because it, it, if it's made of nothing more than atoms then how can an how can an atom kind of bring about that process i mean what, what i'm mean. hearing from you, alex is of course you know mm. this electron banging into that electron doesn't equal a thought about london or socrates but when you have a complex brain structure that's doing all kinds of clever things that yeah. is a kind of emergent property to use one of the just just mm-hmm. as to mention oh, computers okay. as you briefly mentioned mm-hmm. earlier if, you, if you're somebody who believes in the concept of artificial intelligence that we can have computers <clears throat> that essentially can think about things in an electronic sense right and they're not thinking about things in a conscious sense but we're not talking here about being necessarily mm-hmm. aware of the thoughts we're having but just the capability mm-hmm. of thoughts <clears throat> to be had about these things like um, it's a similar kind of process going on in the brain it's just that it's made of biological stuff instead of electronic stuff yeah, so, I mean, you, you brought up books, and that's a little bit similar to the case of computers in a way, in the following sense. So, I mean, I think, um, you, you know, you made the point that um, a book is made of atoms, I would agree with that, and yet a book is about lots of stuff, presumably. <clears throat> Doesn't that show that a thing that is basically built out of physical stuff can have intentionality? And I think that the, the response there would be simply that the intentionality if we want to call it that of books and and you know um code in a computer is a derived intentionality yeah, it comes from their maker right yeah right so so i mean take an example of deep blue the chess computer and, and it makes a certain move um the move to the computer itself has no meaning it's a string of uh, presumably of ones and zeros but it within a framework that we confer on, you know, on the move, um, the move has meaning. Um, and John Searle actually kind of made this point um, with what's known as the, the sort of Chinese room analogy. Um, and, and the idea there is basically, you know, imagine yourself, suppose that you don't know Chinese, but you're sitting in a room where someone's feeding Chinese characters into the room and, and you've been given a set of rules of if it's if it's this character then it goes into this box and you can do this all day and um, and the thought is essentially that's what a computer is doing on a very complex level but the computer that there is no meaning or intentionality yeah. for the, the person the computer isn't thinking i need to do this to do that yeah it's simply <clears> following <throat> a set of instructions essentially that's right and so which so, we have imbued with me yeah so yeah. any appearance of intentionality is there solely in virtue of our intentionality and so then you're back to the problem that we started with, which is how to account for our intentionality. So there's there's an interesting yes. yeah point um, to um, but I'm I'm point. interested in uh, in order to discuss this properly. I'm interested in kind of dispelling of a potential double standard that people might um, see in the escape from these kind of problems by referring to supernaturalism and, and, and <clears> God, which is that to me you. Is it not the case that you need to presuppose reason in order to uh, in order to come up with the justification that you're that you're coming up with for reason? If you see what I mean, I mean, if you're going to say that mm. we can have reason because of the fact that we're going to ground it in supernaturalism, we're going to ground it in yeah. God. Don't you need to presuppose reason in order to reason that that's the case? Yeah. So I, right, that's a fair question, I think. And this, I think, this actually comes up um, in relate, particularly um, the the Alvin Plantinga argument that we we alluded to mm. earlier, which says, you know, it, and the way he frames it, I think, actually does raise this question that Alex brings up, because he wants to say, if you're a naturalist, um, then you should sort of doubt your reason in a nutshell. Mm. But then then you think, well, but didn't the naturalists need to presuppose their reason to follow planting his argument Mm. to get this conclusion that they should distrust their reason? And that looks a bit funky. But it's not just that, because obviously Mm -hmm. planting, you can say that like, you know, we, we, I can, I can justify using reason Mm. as a whole. What what I'm saying specifically is about like, um, is about from, from like, from the very beginning, it's like, let's say that we're trying to justify reason. It's like, you can't even begin having that conversation Mm. at all. Yeah, unless you presuppose the conclusion that reason is that the and and the thing is mm. like, if you're then also saying if the argument is going to be that the only way you can have reason is through some kind of supernatural agency, mm. then not mm. only do you have to presuppose reason, but you have to presuppose supernatural agency before you even begin the conversation. Okay, so I think what I want to say to that is that so the way I'm not formulating this argument in the way Plantinga formulates his so. There's there's basically two different ways to do this. One is to say um, 
Look, it's sort of an open question whether we have reason or not. And given naturalism, you're sort of required to give up on it. And I think you're, I think implicitly you're taking issue with that because, of course, one has to presuppose reason to go through those steps. Step, yeah. Now, I want to say that's not the way I'm framing this. So then there's a different way of approaching it, which is to say, look, here's the data. Um, the data is that we have intentionality, the ability to make inferences. We, we can both agree on that. Um, and then the question is which hypothesis best accounts for that data, best predicts it. And so that, um, that does presuppose the data of reason, uh, but not, not in a circular way. And that, that's a very kind of standard way now, I think, of formulating arguments in philosophy of religion. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, we might do the same with, let's say, the fine tuning of the universe. Um, you know, um, we, the, the way it works is roughly we, we both agree to some set of um, physical, you know, empirical data. And then the question is which hypothesis best explains this. Um, and so what we, we do presuppose yeah. certain so, data. So you're both agreeing reasoning happens. Yes. Reasoning yes. exists. Is it most, yeah, do, mm. does it comport best with a naturalistic or That's right. theistic or some so, other So world, what right? I'm not doing is saying Alex should s stop thinking he can reason. Oh, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think you're entitled to to to. So I, that's the, the but you're way questioning in which whether the naturalistic yes, worldview can is ground the best such, yeah. such, such, such yes, a thing. Yes, that's right. I, I mean, I don't know if you want to well, keep I can, going I can, on. That. Well, I can give I can give it a go. Like yeah, so, uh, I think the principal objection to saying that a process like natural selection. Um, cannot because because it, it, it's such a it's, it's one of the, it's such just kind of simple all encompassing thesis. It's like yeah, anything yeah. that can't be explained by by religion. It seems natural selection has something to say about it. But it seems here no, it, it's different because we're talking about mm. ontological mm. truths. We're not talking about survival value or, or, or complexity or anything like that. It's about something more abstract than that. Well, mm. okay, so the argument might go something like this. You know, if, if you if you um, if you hear a noise in a bush as is the common example given, it's evolutionarily advantageous mm. to believe that it's going that, that it's a threat uh, and, and kind of have this instinctual uh, mm. running away, even though that's false, right? You, we evolved to have that kind of instinct. Well, this is true, and you could say that that means that we've evolved to kind of be believing perhaps potentially false things mm. because they are, they, they are uh, beneficial for our survival, but I don't think that's entirely true. For instance, if we, if we evolve mm. an instinct to run away from loud noises, um, that isn't attached to beliefs about ontological truth, right? That's not necessarily mm. attached to a belief that there's something going on in that bush, right? And in fact, if I hear a noise behind me right now, I'll jump because of my evolutionary mm. um, uh, history. But when I turn around and look at it, uh, th then I'm able to see uh, that that's not what's actually happened. Uh, I'll, I'll become convinced that that's not the case. Reason being that if we kind of, if we put to the side like epistemological skepticism, skepticism mm. for, the, for, the, for the moment. Let's just, just kind of grant that our senses are, are accurate here. Um, the person who, when investigating things, not just kind of their instinctual reactions, but when investigating what they see around them, uh, gets it correct, sees that that does actually poison this human being. Mm. That does actually uh, cause mm -hmm. uh, a danger to, to whatever it may be. This does actually improve health or, or whatever mm. it may be. Um, that would almost trivially be selected for. Of course, mm -hmm. evolution is going to select for the brains which were able to look at the things around them, recognize what's real about the world. And then what we have is the coupling of this. This is, this is why I asked earlier, um, and I want to come back to it because I didn't quite finish the thought, I think, about uh, mm -hmm. deduction and the validity of deduction even in a naturalistic universe. It's like, if we can grant, if, uh, as I say, we have to put aside epistemological skepticism because you could say, well, how can you even trust your senses? But I could say the same thing about anybody here. So we're just going to grant that for, for, for the time being and say that if there are things that I see and observe in nature and I can start making kind of uh, comparisons and realizing <clears throat> that there are kind of tautological inferences to be made, that's the beginning of rationality, right? And that's something that would be selected for. And although uh, natural selection is selecting for... Um, survival, the, the most kind of consistent way to ensure the survival of a conscious agent is its ability to realistically understand the world so around it. It sounds like you're saying it's perfectly consistent that our ability to reason would be <clears throat> would confer advantages yeah, but, uh, on us, but, uh, that, that uh, yes. evolution is perfectly happy to, to, to want it's to... It's true, you know, but to, we have to be clear to make sure that pe people aren't 
uh, thinking that I'm suggesting that evolution selects for truth, because I certainly don't no, think it does. A, so it, given <clears> that <throat> evolution selects, selects for survival yes. and for, you know, your genes being propagated in the future, it seems to you that a, a, a reasoning functionality in the brain arising would be uh, a very advantageous thing to happen for a person. Yes. Uh, to be able to make, mm, to, to, mm -hmm. for broadly speaking, to develop true beliefs about the world is, is a kind of... It yes, is, it, is I, I think it, it doesn't select for truth, but it selects for uh, minds that uh, will survive, that, 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 that will, that will, yeah. uh, <clears throat> that will act in accordance with the truth. If you know what I mean, and I think the yeah. definition of reason is acting and thinking in accordance with truth. And to survive, you have to act in accordance with the truth of the of the material world around you. Yeah, good. So, I mean, I think what I I want to emphasize, we need to sort of separate out some of this data here because. <clears throat> On the one hand, we've been talking about its intentionality and, and you know, mental causation. Um, and, and this question of, you know, can you have this if thoughts are basically made out of physical stuff? And then there's this question of, you know, could natural selection select for brains that are good at reasoning? And that's a bit of a, a further down the stream yes, kind that, of that's, question. That's right, it? because yeah. I think, um, I, I don't think you're talking about, it. now I think I can grant the plausibility of some of what you're saying about evolution um, selecting for, you know, sort of capacities to classify various things and say, well, if something falls in this category, then it's probably going to have this property. But all of that is predicated on the assumption that there is even this capacity for thoughts to be about stuff whatsoever. Mm. So evolution doesn't explain intentionality. Evolutionary yep. psychology presupposes intentionality. I think that's a very so, key so, point So the to real make. question, I mean, the most fundamental question, you know, as much as it's interesting to, to, to discuss Alvin Plantinga's argument is, is the fact we can think yeah, at all, yeah. the fact we can have thoughts about things you know, Max is saying, just at that point, you've got a problem with the naturalistic mm -hmm. account. Um, how do we conceive of the idea that yeah. physical atoms, electrons and stuff are in fact giving rise to um, these thoughts about things, which, um, you know, it's the classic kind of mind body problem, I think, at some level, it, which is what, how does a physical thing produce a, uh, a sensation or, a, or this intentionality in exactly this case that, yeah. about something? And, yeah, seems I, to me that we're, we're kind of talking about the development of consciousness here. We're, we're, we're talking about the development of uh, some kind of faculty um, for, uh, uh, as you say, thinking about things. But I, maybe I'm just misunderstanding why this needs to be so complicated. I mean, like the development, let, let's say we framed it in terms of the development of memory. I think uh, when you talk about consciousness, people think of it as this kind of crazy, mysterious kind of cloak over our knowledge. But if we just talk about something like memory, it seems a lot more straightforward. I think, I think it wouldn't be too difficult to explain how our faculty for memory might develop. Um, but when we're talking about, you know, thoughts being about things, mm -hmm. we're essentially talking about recall. We're essentially talking about observing things and being able to recall them in the mind, right? Like, I, why does this have to be uh, some kind of different category of evolutionary development to the development of fingers, if you see what I mean? Well, so, so I think... And that's a genuine <clears throat> question rather than an argument. Right? right, so, I mean, intentionality isn't just about recall. I mean, it, it's, it's literally about any kind of thought whatsoever. So, um, and it can be a thought about a fictional object like a unicorn. Um, the point is not um, whether, you know, the, the object is one I'm observing currently or have observed in the past. The point is more fundamental than that. It's that very capacity for stuff in my head to represent something uh, whether that thing be fictional, or real, past or present. And um, yeah, so and, and in terms of, um, so, so let me use an analogy. I think in a sense, evolutionary psychology, and by which, by the way, I, do, I don't dispute all of its hypotheses, um, but evolutionary psychology is sort of about saying, you know, when you've got these, these bricks, which are, if you like, sort of capacity for human thoughts, full stop, you know, you've got these bricks and then how do they get arranged into this very impressive building. Evolutionary psychology, the, the sorts of theories you've been alluding to about the development of the mind um, <clears throat> as shaped by natural selection, in essence all, all that's getting at um, is you know, once you've got the bricks, how do they then get arranged? It doesn't touch yeah, it doesn't that question of how you get the bricks yeah. in the first place. Yeah. And, and so, so 
we're going to go to our next break, but I feel like we've kind of hit a kind of the rock bottom kind of <clears throat> question at the bottom of this, which is how how do our thoughts, if they are ultimately con- constituted by physical things, atoms, electrons, and so on, how how do they um, manifest, if you like, in our consciousness as thoughts about things, which seems necessary mm. for reason to, to happen for something to entail another thing. That's the second kind of mystery in this is, is how does a, having a thought about one thing um, and uh, the, the, a thought about another thing, and when you connect them, create a third thought. Um, because what I'm getting from you, Max, is that if you were just looking at what's going on in the brain at that point, this electron goes here, that electron goes mm. there, you would not see anything that looks like what the actual experience mm. of us reasoning is in that sense. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just where I'll, I'll leave it yeah. and then we'll go to our break and, and, and mm-hmm. come back to Alex to, mm. to continue this. Um, fascinating discussion, quite a deep dive today. It's taken us off in different directions, actually. I'm enjoying the way mm. we've, we've gone into evolution and, and other parts of the, the spectrum here. But we're at the core of this, we're, we're looking at an argument popularized in many ways by C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles, The mm. Argument from Reason Against Naturalism. And we'll continue with my guests, Alex and Max, very shortly. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. So welcome back to the final part of this discussion between my guests, Max baker Heitch and Alex O'Connor. Uh, do check out Max online. Um, he is a tutor over at the Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. Uh, you can find some of his academic papers if you just um, search for his name, and uh, I'm sure you'll find some, some interesting stuff there. Alex has tons of um, content uh, on the YouTube channel he runs, Cosmic Skeptic. Um, really fascinating discussions and dialogues on there as well. Um, but uh, CosmicSkeptic.com takes you to the sort of the central page for exploring that um i appreciate both of you coming in to do this this quite sort of abstract conceptual kind of discussion Mm. sometimes Mm -hmm. i've i've been trying to kind of um i think put a bit of flesh on it because i think so often if someone's watching or listening they can think okay i think i get that but but how does that work uh and what it's kind of boiled down to in the end i feel like alex is is a sort of that classic question of of how does physical stuff produce consciousness or yeah. the aboutness of our thoughts and this is a debate we've kind of done with other people mm. like Daniel Dennett and, and many others over the years um, but it seems quite fundamental to, to this argument from, from is, reason yeah. because it's that classic problem of if if at the bottom of all of this there's there's physical stuff going on where does the you know the, the, the aboutness of the mind come stuff from, come from yeah uh, which which then produces this entanglement problem potentially and, and yeah. everything else so th- this problem I mean th- th- this problem, as you say, it's just kind of like uh, it, it's just the question of how we get from uh, fr- from natural explanations to, to talking about minds, right? And mm. this is why I bring up something like memory. I feel like it's 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 analogous, if not uh, strictly relevant, because it's like it seems to be kind of a different category of stuff. Something like memory, it's like brain process, it's mind process. It seems to have more agency behind it, but it's not a controversial thing to say that that can arise from naturalistic processes. And as we were just briefly discussing in the break, it's like we don't fully understand, perhaps never will fully understand the brain. It's the most complex thing we've ever discovered in the universe, right? And like there are there are areas such as this which are a bit hazy, but it seems to me that um, our naturalistic explanations of the brain are are quite sufficient to explain most of its phenomena. And even if it can't quite explain consciousness, which many people will claim that it can, um, but even if it can't, like, I, I think that then just almost becomes an argument from, um, an argument from, I don't know what the, the exact uh, term to use here would be, perhaps an argument from ignorance, perhaps an argument um, from... And if you're pushing it in the direction of God, a, a God of the gaps, essentially. <coughs> I suppose so, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not quite, because I mean, you're not just kind of saying this is, this is God, you're talking about kind of an unexplained area of, of psychology and, mm. and uh, hypothesizing some kind of supernatural agency. I, I think that that's a, perhaps a, a step that we don't need to take or we're a bit too hasty to take. I, I think that we should just recognize that like, I mean, uh, for instance, perhaps to wrap up that, that kind of part of the discussion, do, do you think it's possible for a process of thought uh, and thinking about things and intentionalism, this kind of stuff? 
to arise from naturalistic processes? Do you think it's possible at all? Like, do you think it's like conceivably mm -hmm. possible in principle? Um, no. So I think that given that, um, given w how we've defined naturalism earlier in the program, that the the basic resources that you have to to if you like to build conscious well and, and actually we haven't talked about conscious experience itself which i would say is actually one layer more fundamental than intentionality just that the the, the existence of a first person subjective perspective mm. um just see and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you sort of be open at least to thinking that we, we don't have an, an explanation for that at least currently but yeah i, I mean what i want to say there is it, it's not a sort of claim that um we don't yet sort of know the, the mechanism or the arrangement. Uh, we don't fully understand the arrangement of physical stuff that you would need to get this first person perspective and then this aboutness. It's, it, it is something more fundamental than that, namely that the, the ingredients that naturalism gives us are not, they, they, um, they don't en enable us to, to build that kind of stuff. Um, the physical stuff, um, which has no first person perspective is no matter the thought is, yeah, no matter how you combine it, no matter how complex the arrangement, that physical stuff is never going to produce a first person perspective. Um, yeah. if, if, if the court, you know, yeah, I see what you mean. I, I think yeah. that that's perhaps the difference then because to me, yeah, I, I've had a lot of conversations with people about this, this topic of like how something like awareness can arise and perhaps we should have discussed that because I think it's really interesting mm. and something I've been <clears throat> uh, reading a lot about specifically in relation to non-human animals and mm. whether they have awareness too. Um, it seems to me that like you can, you can have a process by which, uh, if a, if an object or an organism or, or a molecule or something begins to kind of react to its environment mm. in, in, a, in a purely naturalistic sense, we can begin to see what we might call the origins of self-awareness, like an, an ability to react to an environment. Mm -hmm. You can understand <clears throat> why it would be more advantageous if as well as being able to kind of, so, so let's say that you kind of, uh, like, like, a, like the flower that follows the sun across the sky, that kind of thing. It's like, that's obviously not a kind of, uh, that's not evidence of self-awareness. But if we talk about the development of, of faculty like that, um, we can see why it would be beneficial to have not just a kind of, um, not just a, 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 what you might call an instinctual reaction, which mm. is essentially what it would be, to kind of a, a desire to do so, uh, uh, developing the experiences of pleasure and pain, right? Mm. And if you experience a develop, if you experience, uh, if you develop the experience for pain, um, then you can experience, th then you can develop the experience of desires, um, and so on and so forth, and, and the complexity just kind of keeps building, and, and, and awareness can be seen on this kind of gradual scope. We don't need to see it as a kind of on-off switch, right? And if we do, then I think mm. it would be the on-off switch of, of pain and pleasure, which is a fairly simple thing to explain mm. evolutionarily, if you, if you see what I'm saying. Mm. Um, I think that kind of looking at it in, in a grand scheme of kind of the evolution of basic uh, mm. awareness uh, of our surroundings, reactions to our surroundings, and how that can just become more complex to involve pleasure and pain and then desire, and then see how that would, uh, again, that's talking about like awareness specifically, mm -hmm. you then have to make mm -hmm. further kind of added complexity of, of abstract thought. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, well, what I could, do you do you think there's something in that narrative of, okay, you start with something very simple, mm -hmm. like just an organism, mm -hmm. you know, a, a single cell organism that doesn't want to go into yeah. that, you know, you know that, that has some kind of instinctual reaction to something eventually with enough complexity in time you can get abstract thought at the end of the well process. and so I, I don't think anything i've said commits me to denying gradualism if you like that that um yeah of course there's a spectrum of, of levels of consciousness uh, conscious awareness but i think that the point i want to make it well and and we haven't really talked about conscious awareness itself we've more talked about intentionality mm -hmm. which kind of presupposes conscious mm -hmm. awareness but conscious awareness itself is is an interesting puzzle and and it's not just theists who, who think this you know a number of leading philosophers of mind like david chalmers tim crane thomas nagel would say that they think that um, qualia, you know, first person subjective experience, um, even if that's the first person subjective experience of a fly, if flies have that, I don't know whether they do. That does seem to be a, just a different kind of thing from brain states. Um, and it, I mean, that there are various philosophical arguments that it would take us too long to get into that, that, that sort of underscore this point that this, 
first person what it's like to feel pain or whatever is just a different kind of thing from what it you know what happens when um when neurons fire in the brain and so um i i think just talking about how um you uh, things unfold gradually doesn't basically doesn't really touch that question of why there is this first person subjective perspective and i would add i think that's it's particularly a puzzle if you subscribe to this idea that physical uh, physical states and events are causally sufficient to explain everything that happens in the world. And, and as we sort of right. discussed earlier, I think that is one of the sort of tenets of naturalism. Because then you have this puzzle, why does there need to be, I mean, you talked about selective advantage, Alex. Now, what I think I'd be happy to grant is that there's selective advantage in my brain being in certain states that make me my body move in certain ways that get me to do stuff. But then if the physical stuff that's happening in the brain is causally sufficient, why does there need to be, from an evolutionary point of view, this, this other quite different thing, this first person subjective perspective? You know, so um, philosophers of mind would say that, you know, if you're committed to this idea of causal closure, you know, physical causes are sufficient to account for everything, including our behavior. Consciousness would have to be an, an epiphenomenon, a bit like the steam that comes off a kettle. It's not, it's not causally necessary to explain our behavior. So I, I think yeah. you've got this further puzzle of why would this mm. physical yeah, well, I, stuff... I, th I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to just say that uh, an understanding of, of uh, an organism's own place within uh, its environment and its community is, is kind of has seemingly obvious advantages, but also even if it doesn't, if it were just an offshoot, of course, evolution doesn't just, um, doesn't necessarily like stop the production of useless things, right? Like you, you can have side effects, you can have things that aren't mm. harmful that just happen to be there. If that's the case, then the fact that the, the argument that I could make um, for the development of, of uh, justified reason in human beings might be an evolutionary offshoot, but that doesn't affect the truth Mm -hmm. of, of whether it, of his accuracy or not, if you know what I mean, like, like sure, maybe maybe it is just an offshoot, but that doesn't mean that it that it's not an accurate offshoot. It doesn't mean that it doesn't actually hold to the truth. We'll do a quick response, and then yeah. I just want to wrap <clears throat> up with the the kind of but question I, of whether it yeah. takes us in the but direction. But I, also, of God I just want to yeah. make sure that people people are aware. Like what this seems to suggest to me is that um, in order to kind of undermine the argument that you're making, all that people really have to believe is that it is possible to naturally evolve conscious processes, right? That, that seems to be the kind of crux of the point. And I wasn't talking about gradation that leads to conscious awareness, but the gradation of conscious awareness. And I think that if <clears throat> a listener can uh, agree that it's plausible that conscious awareness and ultimately feelings of pleasure and pain and this kind of stuff can evolve from naturalistic causes, then um, they can disagree with the, the argument that you're making, I think. Would that perhaps be <clears throat> the way to disagree with you here then? So I want to say no, because this is a probabilis probabilistic argument. This is about which hypothesis makes the data more likely or not. So, you know, my earlier example of the leaves on the lawn, it, it's possible, it's physically possible, uh, it's logically possible as well, for the leaves to be arranged to spell out the person's name. By the wind. Right, by, yeah. the, uh, by the wind, sorry, thanks, mm. Justin. Um, uh, but the question is which hypothesis predicts this data more strongly and yeah. merely to say it, it's possible in some sense, which I, I think I might be willing to grant, it, it is conceivable that evolution throws up this unnecessary offshoot, namely subjective experience. That doesn't show that the naturalistic hypothesis makes this data at all likely, and that's really the key question. Here. I, I mean, do you feel then that overall, as, as you mm. understand this argument, Max, obviously that that it is more it comports more with the theistic view then, um, and yeah, mm. th th presumably your view is if if naturalism can't account for this phenomena. Uh, we're, we're in a better position to say there's something that underlies this mm. physical world that that is. Um, you know, mm. the, a divine mind, essentially. Well, yeah, and so I want to be quite cautious about the significance of this argument. So I, I think, um, I don't want to say it's directly an argument for theism. I think it's an argument for a family of hypotheses mm. uh, among which, you know, of, of which theism is a member. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's first and foremost an argument for thinking that mental... Um, you know, mental stuff, um, intentionality, conscious awareness, and so on, has to be at the base layer of reality. 
Now, there are, um, as you both well know, there are other um, views of reality besides theism which would say that um, you know, consciousness, intentionality and so on are at the base layer of reality. So, I mean, we, so then I think it's a further step to then say, well, of those various mm. hypotheses, those various non-naturalistic hypotheses, um, which one is the best? Yeah. Yeah. So you do kind of have to <clears throat> produce further arguments for why I think so. It, yeah, it isn't um, some kind of platonic realm that exists. Of, That's right. Of, of and and, and I think it's it notable, yeah. you know, that someone like Thomas Nagel, who's definitely not a believer in God, <clears throat> mm. um, nonetheless, I think wants to say that that um, qualia, conscious um, experience, intentionality, purpose, and so on, are at the, are metaphysically fundamental. They're yeah. at the base layer. But that base layer isn't conceived of as a personal mm. god mm. for him, and and I don't want to sort of say that that yeah. that kind yeah. of view is totally out it, of the it, question. It's interesting because I've met increasingly a number of um, people, even well-known people like Philip Pullman. I remember when I had him on the show, well-known as an atheist, a writer, and so on, but said he disagrees with the naturalistic hypothesis. Mm -hmm. He believes that there's a kind of a consciousness that exists at the the bottom of everything, and um, and. He says, you know, some of his atheist colleagues, Dawkins and so on, really disagree with him mm. on that. But that's mm -hmm. his perspective on how he then makes sense of the object, yeah. the, the purpose and the, the kind of the consciousness that, that he obviously feels is important. Um, I mean, you've come on to sort of defend a naturalistic position to some extent. Essentially, uh, well, well I, I but, suppose I but, just but, need to defend its plausibility. And yeah. I think that you talk about like making an argument um, from probability, which is true, but you can essentially turn it into a deductive argument by saying that the, the hypothesis is like, you know, it's it's more probable that this is the case, and if it's more probable that this is the case, then we should believe it, right? It's essentially what we're saying. I, I guess the question is, what is a more probable explanation of the development of self-consciousness, and especially taking into consideration the way in which it seems to have uh, come about in human beings, which is through a process of, of long and gradual evolution. It's like, what would we expect to see if we were to assume a naturalistic explanation for the mm. development of conscious thought, well, we'd probably expect to see um, a slightly not fully understood, but very long and very complex process from which there was much trial and error. Um, mm. Probably some forms of life which didn't quite get there and didn't manage to develop conscious awareness. Maybe some forms of life that did develop conscious awareness, but didn't quite manage it in the same way that we do and don't have a capacity for rational thought as we do. Um, and eventually kind of something mm. that manages to kind of land on it and get it right. And, and based on that, uh, is able to benefit their own survival such that they become uh, the most important species or, or uh, at the top of the kind of hierarchy mm -hmm. of power. Um, that's probably what we'd expect to see. And that seems to be what we, what we observe. If we were, if we were taking a, a theistic or supernaturalistic, a supernatural, uh, I should say, view of the development of consciousness, um, I don't know that we'd expect <coughs> it to evolve in that way. And, and so when you talk about what's more probable, it's like, I've got no problem with making a probabilistic argument, but I'd say that there's at least an argument to be made that it's more probable, um, or, or, or rather, I should say that it is a more plausible explanation for the way that consciousness seems to have developed, um, that it's come from natural causes rather than mm. it's come from any <clears throat> kind of divine or supernatural agency. Quick, quick response, and then we'll, we'll yeah, wrap things well, up. Yeah, well, in okay, in terms of, well, there's two bits there. How probable is the development of consciousness as we see it in, this, in, in our world? given naturalism and how probable is it or would it be given theism so i think you, you we basically don't get to assign a high probability to this um, emergence of consciousness given naturalism unless you can show why i mean i, I suppose really to reiterate what i said earlier if if you're committed to the causal closure of the physical that's to say physical goings on are fully causally sufficient to explain everything including our behavior what what you would expect on naturalism let's just say is the development of more and more complex um, brains that you know allow creatures in more and more sophisticated ways to move around their environments but again given the causal closure of the physical there is no reason whatsoever to expect those brain processes however complex they may be to be accompanied by first person conscious awareness and I, I don't think I've yet heard a reason now we can both agree I think that it's logically possible that it do so but that's not a reason for assigning it a, a high probability at all and then in terms of the development of consciousness on theism I mean and 
you make the point that um, what we do see in, in our world is a, a, a rather gradual development of conscious awareness, and I, I'd fully grant that. Um, I suppose then, you know, this gets more into questions of to what extent would we expect God to create a world sort of through an un, a slow unfolding process as opposed to sort of ex nihilo in one go, you know, us here are complex uh, creatures as we are just kind of uh, from nothing. And um, I suppose all I'd say there is um, it, it's not obvious to me at all that um, we would expect we would have a strong expectation that God would do it in the sort of all in one go as opposed to the gradual way of doing things. I mean, and but of course, this gets tricky in terms of assessing what God would do. I mean, and, and I think certainly in the sort of and we haven't at all talked about Christian theism in this program so far, but I mean, I think we do ha to assess God's intentions. We do have to get into specific versions of theism because they will make different predictions. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think the 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 kind of biblical portrait of God is a is of a God who sometimes does stuff in in an instant. But I would almost say more often does things through unfolding narratives and and processes. Um, and so then that that would lead me to not be too surprised if that was how he were to create conscious life. I mean, that's that's a subject for a whole other program, potentially. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, um, that's just a, that, it's essentially just a, a common objection here all the time. Why yeah, would yeah, God have done yeah, it this way? Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I mean, specifically when it comes to the development of consciousness, I'm interested in kind of the, I, I'm talking specifically about, about the way that consciousness evolved, not the fact that it evolved over a long time rather than okay. popping into existence. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, the mechanisms by which it evolved seem to be more in line with naturalism than supernaturalism. But um, you're right, I mean, it is, well, we'll we'll have to leave that one there yeah. because we're out of time. But it's been a really great mm. conversation. Thank you both. Um, mm. uh, as I say, uh, you can find out more about Max and indeed uh, C.S. Lewis's argument from reason and the way that Max has developed it. If you go and look for his uh, his name, I'll make sure there's a link from today's show in the info accompanying this program. Um, and Alex O'Connor uh, is available, of course, as the Cosmic Skeptic uh, on YouTube and at the website. And I'll make sure there are links too. But um, fascinating discussion from you. Thank you very much for coming in and doing a deep dive with me mm -hmm. on this uh, particular argument. And uh, hopefully I'll get you both back again at some point in the future. Anytime. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you.